Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Holly and you're watching Travel Insights, the show that takes you through new destinations around the globe, dives into hot trends in the travel and tourism space, and engages in insightful conversations with industry experts. On today's episode, we're hitting the open water and setting sail to explore the world of cruising. We'll also be sitting down for a chat with Mr. John Alwyn Jones, the cruise editor of Global Travel Media. So stick with us for the latest and greatest from the space. For the unfamiliar, let's first explore the basics of cruises and answer some of your burning questions. First of all, is cruising expensive? Well, when comparing a week at sea to a week at a resort, for instance, you'll find it to be actually relatively cheaper in comparison. This is because a lot is included in your ticket. Your meals, accommodation, entertainment, and most activities. Anything extra is up to you. Who exactly is cruising for? Well, despite what you might think, cruising isn't just for retirees and families with young kids. As a matter of fact, multi-generational cruising is booming which means ships are providing a more diversified range of activities for various age groups. Will you get bored? Hmm. Well, a surprising number of people see this as a possibility, but let me tell you, the cruise lines look more like small cities floating in the ocean than ships sometimes. That means that you can go ice skating, rock climbing, or practice your golf swing, shoot a few hoops, go to the casino and see a Broadway-style show, as well as shopping, spa days, and swimming in the pool, even riding a roller coaster. And that sounds anything but boring to me. Will you get seasick? Now, this depends on the person, but it's worth noting that today's cruise ships are engineered with state-of-the-art stabilizers that greatly reduce the ship motion. And if you're still worried about that sickness, I recommend choosing a cabin towards the center of the ship where movement is less severe. What's there to do in port? As you probably know, cruise ships port on land at different points in your destination, giving you the chance to roam around incredible sights. Still concerned about that boredom? Well, I doubt you will be, because there's just so much to do on shore. Snorkeling, mountain climbing, exploring ancient ruins, it all depends on your destination. What should you pack? Good question. Cruises tend to be casual during the day, although in the evening, dress codes might vary depending on the occasion. On formal nights, for example, you'll need to wear something a little fancier than normal. Think suits and cocktail dresses. And lastly, what about tipping? Although we're not accustomed to tipping here in Australia, some cruise lines have this as policy. Most of the liners include a tipping guideline in the passenger cabins, which you can check to make sure. Other than that though, tipping is a matter of individual preference. With that said now, we know the cruise industry has had a rough couple of years since COVID hit, despite being set for a prosperous future. So to set, shed some light on what's going on in the space, we're joined by Mr. John Alwyn Jones, the cruise editor of Global Travel Media. Stay tuned. On today's episode of Travel Insights, I'm joined by Mr. John Alwyn Jones, cruise editor of Global Travel Media. Welcome to the show, John. Let's talk cruises. Now, cruises are more decked out and luxurious than ever before, and the industry was headed for another prosperous year before the pandemic hit. So what can you tell us about the state of the cruise industry at present? Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about cruising. You know, people say to me, oh, I've, you know, I don't like cruising. I would never go on a cruise. And you say, well, have you been on a cruise? No. Have you stayed in a hotel? Well, yes. Well, there are so many different hotels and just the same way, there are so many different cruises. So you made the comment before about cruises going luxurious. Yes, many have gone ultra luxurious, but cruising appeals to everybody. Families with kids, adults, you name it, cruising appeals to them. And if you wanted to put a star rating, you can probably do the same thing with ships and say, this is a two or three star ship. This is a seven star ship. But in terms of the um, future of cruising or what's happened with cruising, 
Look, it was inevitable, I suppose, in a sense. COVID-19 is a very uh, sort of infectious disease or virus. And anywhere where you get a lot of people gathering, then, you know, COVID-19 will spread. And unfortunately, cruising had a bit of a bad rap at the beginning. And part of the reason for that is because we didn't know much about COVID-19. We didn't know how it spread and so on. So Ruby Princess, Diamond Princess and so on, um, they were very difficult situations and um, not um, at the fault of the cruise industry, quite honestly, either, because we didn't know and the health authorities didn't know. So um, in terms of the safety features going ahead or the protocols going ahead, look, the world's been working very hard at these things. Um, in Australia, we have the Cruise Lines uh, International Association in Australia that's been working with protocols. And look, I think probably reading between the lines as a cruise specialist, they found it very frustrating getting the government to actually get their head around things because the government is extremely risk averse. And you don't blame them because they don't understand cruising and they don't understand that cruise ships are probably the safest possible environment you could be in. Um, in a COVID-19 uh, scenario. So a lot, of, a lot of things have happened, a lot of protocols are in place, and I'm sure we'll talk about those during this chat. Well, that makes perfect sense. And it's obviously linked to the vaccine passports. Do you think that's the case for cruising as well? Will it become a prerequisite for passengers? You see, people forget that people in office buildings or schools or aged homes or anywhere where a lot of people gather, there's a propensity for diseases to spread. Now, the cruise industry has been dealing with norovirus for, for very many years, and I've written often about this and spoken often about it. Norovirus is not a cruise ship problem. People bring norovirus on the cruise ship, then they don't follow the sanitation rules on board the ship, and it spreads because it's a tactile thing. You touch there, you eat something, you touch the food, you'll get norovirus. The difference with COVID is it's airborne. Okay, so it was inevitable anywhere, a football stadium where a lot of people gather, it will spread. And unfortunately, on cruise ships, it did. Not as much as we thought, to be honest, okay? And if you think about it, the numbers of outbreaks or very large outbreaks on cruise ships were very limited compared to other public places. And the reason for that is because sanitation on board cruise ships is extremely strict. I mean, even in norovirus, when a ship goes to red level, the whole ship is sanitized, and that's a very small percentage of people with norovirus. The whole ship is sanitized continuously. So it's quite amazing. Yes, very safe. Absolutely. Now, could you shed some light for us on the financials of the sector? Where is cash flow positive and where is it still hemorrhaging? Well, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of innuendo and rumour, and there's a lot of this around COVID-19, including the anti-vaxxers and everybody else. But look, yes, the industry did get hit really, really badly. And yes, it did close down effectively. I mean, for example, um, you know, the Australian government decided for some very strange reason to say to all the ships that normally operate here, you're not home ported here, so you have to leave, which is crazy because ships aren't home ported anymore because they're registered in Hamilton, Bermuda or Nassau, Bahamas or whatever. So there were 75 ships at one point in the bay in Manila. I mean, the 75 multi-million dollar cruise ships. So all in what they call warm layup. A warm layup is when a ship goes into a sort of semi-frozen state, has a limited crew on board because, and the, the owners don't know when it will operate. So all these ships around the world, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ships, probably about 900 in total, all in warm layer. The most amazing thing about it is, and people say, oh, well, it'll be a long time before cruising gets going again. As of today, there are 190 cruise ships operating around the world totally successfully with the odd outbreak of COVID on board. But because so many people have been vaccinated, the COVID is not spreading back, okay? So they can, and they know the protocols, they're taken off the ship immediately, um, and it's dealt with professionally by people who know what they're doing. So there are ships operating around the world, very successfully, very happily, and a range of things have happened as well. The popularity of luxury cruising has come out as well. And that's partly because people are probably looking for smaller ships. So some of these luxury ships are smaller ships. 
a lot more interest in adventure cruising um, to the Arctic or the Antarctic with only maybe 100 passengers or 50 or 10 passengers on a ship, some small ships. Um, so the market is changing, but you know, the demand for cruising is pent up, it's huge. Um, a world cruise in 2023 with one company sold out in like five minutes globally. And we're talking about, um, you know, cru- the whole world cruise is about $100,000. Um, the CLIA said in December 2020, so a little bit a while ago, that 74% of cruisers are likely to cruise in the next few years. And that's actually increased. Um, but what's interesting as well is that whilst lots and lots of governments, the US government has been particularly active in the protocols, and there's cruising going on in the USA at the moment, out of Florida, out of a number of ports in the, uh, in the US. But the, um, it's quite amazing. There are four big companies, really. Carnival Corporation, Royal Caribbean Group, Norwegian Cruise Lines, and MSC. They're the biggest ones. They account for 80% of all the berths in the market at this point in time. They all have ships operating. They're, for example, Carnival, by the end of 2021, we'll have 74% of its fleet operating. Royal Caribbean, they've got 61 ships, and the yeah, Carnival's got uh, 95 ships. So Royal Caribbean, with 61 ships, will have 87% of its fleet operating. Norwegian Cruise Lines has got 28 ships. They'll have 78% of their fleet operating. And MSC Cruises has 19 ships, and will have 97% of its fleet operating by the end of 21. So there's a lot happening in the industry. Some of the ships are operating on 50% capacity or 60% capacity because that's part of the deal. Um, and for example, p Cruises in the UK have just launched their brand new ship, Iona. She's about 4,000 passengers. She's running on about 2,500 guests at the moment. So a lot happening. Do you know one of the things that's most interesting is that irrespective of what the cruise companies are saying, and some of the authorities. For example, in Australia, the government here hasn't mandated what protocols are yet. CLAA has been working very hard with them to try and get those. And at the moment, the policy is only around testing. Whereas over 80% of the passengers with cruise or the uh, the respondents to a survey with cruise critic in the USA said they would prefer to cruise on a ship where the guests are fully vaccinated which I fully understand and I'm 100% supportive of. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And those are some staggering figures when it comes to losses. On the other hand, though, from the numbers you mentioned of cruises that are already active and setting sail, it seems as though recovery for this industry is well underway. No, recovery is well underway, and many of the ships that are in warm layer, none virtually, went into what's called cold layer. Cold layer is when basically the ship's tied up or anchored or whatever, and everything is switched off. And that takes about six months to get the ship going again. Uh, warm layer takes about three months, something like that, or possibly a bit less, um, because there's a skeleton crew of about 100. I mean, if you imagine a large ship would have about 900 crew, when it's in warm layup, it's got 100 crew. So they're there to keep everything running, the air conditioning, the pumps, the engines, everything. But then it still has to be recertified as a cruise ship for insurance purposes, compliance purposes, its certification with Lloyd's or North Veritas, whoever it is, and North Veritas, that still has to happen. So it takes time. Um, so it is well underway. There are not many ships now still in warm layup. They're all getting back into action. And some of the smaller operators have been able to do that more successfully, but they're still constrained a bit by government regulations. And um, it is very disappointing in the Australian context that the Australian government hasn't moved further forward um, in terms of at least saying, look, we understand you know, what cruising is all about. They've got a panel that's advising them and saying, look, um, we know it, we know cruising is not going to start immediately, but here are the protocols at this point in time that we expect cruise operators to comply with. I mean, there's a company called um, Trade Wind Voyages. They've got the largest sailing cruise ship in the world. Can you imagine? It takes 270 people. It's a five-masted square rigger. It was supposed to be in Australia in December, January, and February next year, right, 2021, 20, uh, what are we now, 21, 22. 
And they have said they're cancelling their Australian program because of the lack of progress by the Australian government in coming up with any protocols that they can work on. Because the investment for them is this ship is cruising in, in Europe at the moment. It will go down through the Suez Canal. That was the idea. They had to scrap India because of COVID, because there are lots of places in the world where COVID is still incredibly bad. And she was then coming to Australia. And it's too risky for them to send a ship all the way to Australia on the basis the government might let them in or they might not let them in. So they said, no, we're going to the Caribbean instead. Well, I've got to say, it seems like it makes more sense from their end. And it seems like as well that the government has very little to no plans in action for the industry. CLA said recently that the government has made no progress whatsoever towards the resumption of cruising in Australia but they continue to negotiate. And there is a panel of cruise industry leaders who are working very hard with the government. And I must say, it must be extremely frustrating for them um, to meet with the government, whether it's on Zoom or whatever, um, because obviously ACT is locked down now, but I think it's been the case for a while that they haven't been able to meet face to face. And actually just explain to the government, look, this is what cruising is all about. This is the economic impact. I mean, people don't think um, you know, a cruise ship, say, there's half a dozen cruise ships operate seasonally out of Australia. Royal Caribbean, Celebrity, um, Carnival Cruise Line, and, um, and you know, Australia. Those ships buy millions and millions of dollars worth of food every year, whether it be steaks for the guests or salads, you know, lettuce for the salads, um, also port fees and um, coach drivers, limousine drivers and all that economic benefit has been lost. And there is no plan for the future at this point in time for the resumption of domestic cruising in Australia. And I'm not saying the government should make a decision and say when it's going to start. It's too hard with everything that's happening because of the Delta variant. But they should say, look, these are the protocols we anticipate at this point in time. And at this point in time, the only protocols are the CLAA members policy which isn't clear whether the government's accepted that or not as a protocol, but the government has issued nothing in terms of these are the protocols going forward that will allow the resumption of domestic cruising in Australia, because the only thing they will allow um, for some time is domestic cruising. In other words, you cruise from Brisbane to Brisbane, Sydney to Sydney, Melbourne to Sydney um, initially, and there may be that the uh, interstate, and then maybe after that intrastate, and then possibly New Zealand, possibly then Pacific Islands. It'll be quite a while before we see cruises going uh, from Australia to overseas ports. And that makes sense, quite honestly, because Indonesia is still crazy with COVID um, and other areas in Asia. So it's going to take a while. But domestic cruising, I interviewed a very, very well-known epidemiologist. I've interviewed two of them, actually, in the last few months. And they both said, and they are world leaders in their field, there is no reason whatsoever why domestic cruising could not start in Australia for Australians now. Safer lockdowns obviously occurring in our major cities, that's a very good point. Just as domestic flights have been given the green light in the past when international flights were a no-go, the domestic cruising industry might just see a faster recovery. Just before we wrap up though, I'd like to ask you if you could recommend one cruise trip for Aussies to embark on post travel bans, what would that be? I know you mentioned Antarctica, which is really interesting. Well, uh, Antarctic cruising is hot without any question, okay? They tend to be smaller ships. It was abused in recent years with some very large ships going there and some fairly dodgy former Russian icebreakers and they had some environmental issues with a couple of them hitting icebergs or whatever and sinking and stuff like that. It needs very, very careful environmental management. And therefore, there's a lot of activity going on at the moment to limit the amount of cruising that goes to Antarctica. And the the majority of them, some can go from New Zealand or you know even Tasmania, but the majority go from Ushuaia in, um, in South America and they go to the other side of the of Antarctica. Absolutely amazing. You can only go in the Southern Hemisphere spring, but of course, uh, summer, sorry. But of course, in the Northern Hemisphere summer, you can actually now also go to the Arctic. But they are specialists. 
So for example, it doesn't interest me in the slightest because I love warm weather. So the, the calorie, I suppose, or the opposite of that is, I want to go on a ship where um, there's not too much to do, it's not too noisy, um, I want nice cocktails, I want a man walking past every so often so I can say pina colada please, and I want to go, um, oh my god, it must be lunchtime, you know, and go and have a nice lunch. So to answer your question, I think in the medium term, Australians, um, once we're over this issue now, up to sort of the end of the year, domestic cruising will be important. Um, there are many, many ships who want to cruise domestically here in Australia and in New Zealand, and they're already selling programs based on the basis that the, the barriers will be lifted. So companies like Ponant, Coral, uh, Coral Expedition Cruises is cruising in Northern Australia at the moment, but these are all small ships. So I think people will choose and particularly those with disposable income to go more luxurious and have a wonderful, a luxurious experience. Um, if I was a family, had a family with kids, then I would choose one of the larger ships sailing out of Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane, either the Royal Caribbean or p and Australia or Carnival Cruise Lines. So as I said at the beginning, cruising, it depends on who you are, what you are, what you're looking for, but there's no doubt whatsoever it is the best value for money in terms of costing all inclusive because once you get on board foods all included virtually all your entertainments included the kids are looked after if you've got kids they go to kids clubs um, you know it's just such a stress-free holiday and it's a, a wonderful way to cruise with. well john it sounds terrific i can't think of a better place i'd rather be right now but it's time to wrap up there. So in closing, I've got to say thanks so much for joining Travel Insights today. Look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for your time as well, viewers. Stick with us on Travel Insights only on Calcine TV. Well, that was a stellar discussion. And in case you just missed it, we sat down with Mr. John Allen Jones, the cruise editor of Global Travel Media. Now, John mentioned the resurgence of domestic cruising amid the slowly opening up travel scene. So where exactly can you set sail closer to home? Well, Australian and New Zealand cruises take you on a journey to a special part of the world where you'll see spectacular natural wonders like the Great Barrier Reef, New Zealand's Milford Sound, the magnanimity of Melbourne and Sydney, fabled islands like Dili East Timor and Tasmania. And you can traverse an ocean landscape where impossibly green islands seem to float in blue lagoons clearer than you can imagine. Sound too good to be true? Well, it might be a reality sooner than expected, as high levels of vaccination pave the way for easing of travel restrictions. So look no further for a relaxing post-lockdown travel experience than cruises. With that said, it's about time to wrap up, but thanks for cruising through this episode with us and keep watching Calkine TV as we bring you the next episode of Travel Insights next week. This is Holly Shields signing off.